Hey everybody, this is Dustin with Giant Rocket Ship. Here to do my regular office hours talking about auto task. A couple of items that were sent to me. Actually, one I'm looking at a note. I saw it on Reddit. I thought it was very interesting. Um so I'll tackle a couple of things. The first one is um, a question about the admin alerts dashboard. So let's go through that real quick. Now, should be sharing my screen? I am. So it's common that you want to have overview of the status of where some administrative functions are inside of Autotask. And so it's common for people to try to put together dashboards for these clerical kind of administrative tasks. But believe it or not, Autotask has kind of consolidated some of those for you. And let's find a simple one here. And there's a special widget that you're going to want to have for your service manager or your operations manager. And it just consolidates all this information. So again, um, this is like a, a clerical widget. And so it can be used for things like timesheet submissions, contract status. So let's go ahead and do this. What we're going to do is we're going to choose a widget from the widget library. Then we're going to look for the daily alerts right here. I'm going to click next and finish. And of course, I don't have any data, um, data here, I guess, because in my demo tenant, um, we don't have any uh, timesheets or anything. So this is a bad example, unfortunately. Um, but what you will normally see if you have a production auto task, and that's just a door and chain on the demo system. But um, in your production auto task, you're going to see things like people are late submitting their timesheets, which is a big one. Um, and speaking of timesheets, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. Again, the system alerts I find is the best. Um, but what you can also do is you can create widgets to control and alert on these things. For example, timesheets. And what you want to do here is you want to ensure your, your staff is submitting your timesheets. Now, look, I personally do not recommend using Autotask to track paid hours um, for your staff because unless you disable the double billing feature, most help desks let you work on multiple things at a time. <laughs> It actually is not a good time tracking system for how you pay your staff. And the reason is, if you have somebody you're paying them hourly, for example, and they're working on two customers in the same, same amount um, time slot, then that submitted timesheet is going to make it look like they worked twice as long as they really did. And so if you have a 40-hour technician, let's say they double bill all 40 hours, their timesheet is going to save 80 hours. Now, in the U.S. at least, legally, that means you have to pay them 40 hours of overtime, even though they only worked for 40 hours, um, if you were to be using that timesheet. So I, I, I don't like the fact that they are even called timesheets. They should be called billing sheets. Um, but anyways, let's go ahead and create a billing sheet gauge. We'll use timesheets here because I put on a desk once. <coughs> Count of timesheets. What we're going to do here is we are going to create an alert. Just in case staff is late in submitting them. And so uh, let's see here. We would say the status would be one of the not submitted. And the end date would be, you know, you got to give people a couple of days when they come in from the office. And so let's just say today minus, uh, let's see, today minus, let's say 10 days. This is a very simple um, gauge that will alert you when people haven't submitted their timesheets. Um, interesting that it's not collecting that data, but uh, demo environment, obviously you have missing a ton of um, timesheet entries here. Now, you're going to struggle here is if you start using timesheets later in your auto test of deployment, then you're going to also need to create a start cutoff because this goes all the way back to the date of hire or creation of that resource in auto task. Anyways, 
This dashboard, not in a demo environment, clearly, but in a production environment, your daily alerts um, widget can work really well. A quick way how you would track timesheets. So let's see what we have next is um, in, uh, if y'all, if several people have joined already, um, if you can't hear me for some reason, I, had, I have had audio issues in the past, just let me know. How to force, okay, issues with roles and how to force a time entry. This is a good one. So um, I did see this one actually on Reddit. So uh, the question was, how can I enforce time entry on a ticket before it's submitted? <laughs> now, um, it's actually easier than you think it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to go create a workflow rule. And again, the question is, how do I enforce time entry on a ticket? Now you can you can workflow this. Here's the problem: there's no real way for you to workflow it to verify that there's a time entry every time somebody works the ticket. We can only create a workflow that enforces time entries before you close the ticket. I'm going to show you how you would do that. Enforce time entry before ticket close. And let's see what we do here. Show you here we go. So it's actually easier than it looks. So we're going to click edit it by, and then we're going to say status equals but change to complete. Now be careful here because there's a lot of tickets that will auto close because of an RMM or because of, um, let's say you just spam out a ticket. And so it's very common here where you're going to want to worry about the queue. And so this would only be for tickets in my help desk, right? So I'm just going to randomly pick these two. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say if actual hours on the ticket is equal to zero, we know no hours have been added. You can also put minimums here, right? So. Don't let me close a ticket unless I have at least two hours of billable time on this ticket. And so uh, it would be uh, rejected if it, if it was less than two in that situation. But here we're just saying, look, I don't care how much time it is, but I want to see some billable time on this ticket. Otherwise, how are we closing it if we haven't done any work on it? And again, you're going to want to restrict this to where you change to complete. And the queue is usually a help desk queue again because RMMs and automation um, often are going to create, open, and then close tickets without you ever having dealt with them. And in fact, a lot of automation, that's the whole point of them, is so that you don't have to um, expend resources managing that. I'm just looking to see if we have any questions. So again, that's a quick overview. And I, I saw some people join late. Um, again, a recording of this does go out. So again, this was how you enforce time entries on a ticket before it's closed, and I restricted this to help desk. So that's how you would enforce that. The next question I saw was about changing roles. Somebody was struggling to change a role on a ticket. And actually, let's go take a look at what that looks like. So um, demo tickets. Now I'm gonna show you, in fact, I have a blog on this. See if I can pull that up real quick. Um, let's see, bracketship.com and resource role. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm just trying to see if I can hit all the points I hit there. It's very deep somewhere in the blog. We're going to go through it. There's a couple of reasons that's going to happen. Uh, probably the most common reason you can't change your role, like you're working on a ticket and you're doing some stuff, and then let's just go ahead and assign me. Um, and actually, I think the IT change ticket. No. So actually, let's just do Rocket Show. And who's it going to give it to? I think it's going to give it to me in this demo environment. No, it's going to give it to C. Jones. Um, Okay, so we want to find a ticket. We want to send it to me so that I can bill it using my resource. And so we'll just use me here. Let's schedule myself half an hour of work. 
Okay, and so it's going to assign to me and it's going to give me a certain role. And I'm going to show you why people get stuck changing the role on a ticket for themselves. And so look, it's added me. It's going to be scheduling me shortly. Now let's add time to this. Blah, 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 blah. And we're going to give it five minutes. Now, watch what happens when I try to edit my role on this ticket. I changed my role here. Um, one of the things that confuses people is um, that it does not modify the role on the time entries. And so if I do another time entry, because a lot of times what's happening is you do you do work on it, and then you're like, oh, goodness, I did that all wrong, and I put my time in wrong, I need to change my role. And so in this situation, I did change my role, but notice that um, and I'm going to show billing data so you can see everything. I think we need questions so far. Uh, but notice that it's, it's leaving that original role on the ticket, and that's on purpose, right? So that's one thing that tends to confuse people. The next thing that you want to look at is if you're trying to edit um, a ticket and add a person using a specific role and you don't see that role, almost definitely um, the reason is you either don't have the role as a resource or your ticket category is intentionally restricting what roles you see. So let's go to service desk and I want to show you what that looks like. So notice this is a this a ticket category should also could be called like a screen definition. If you think to the old green screens and mainframes, and um, they would have specific screen configuration based on your role. That's essentially what this is. So this is standard. Now notice when I go to my ticket category, ticket category is extremely powerful, by the way. What you can do is you can restrict the roles that are available in that role. Here. I didn't mean click that. So we're going to click edit. And notice here you can customize this to only specific work groups, departments, or resources along with their roles. So, like, let's say for ticket category standard, it's okay for Cindy to work this, but always as a, a QA tier two, never as a tier one. Right. And so it's really powerful to ensure that we have really good billing on our tickets based on the ticket category. And I think there's another place where I can show you, let's see here. It's on this screen. The other place you can kind of modify this is if you're using uh, form templates or speed codes, um, where some of the speed codes preset, like the role for the time entry. Um, then in that situation, you can um, control a lot of that CD time entry form by creating speed codes or form templates that use those roles and then customizing what's available to that ticket category and then stripping out everything else. And it's super helpful if you have like a tier one ticket, so you create a tier one category and then you only include these speed codes for tier one on site, remote, um, admin, things like that. And so um, those are the common reasons why you're not able to modify or use roles on tickets. So just a heads up, absolutely, you can automate that and you can control it using ticket categories. All right, everybody, that was it. Um, if you have questions, I always um, let people know to email me at dustin at giantrocketship.com. And I will tackle two to three of these questions in each of these calls. It's every two weeks. And um, slowly building that video library. And we do upload those. So by all means, go take a look at our YouTube. Um, all right. Thank you. I appreciate it. And have a good one. Bye.